business meeting of the Cave Creek Unified School District. It is 5.30. Do I have a motion to go into executive session to discuss the future of the superintendency for the school district in accordance with ARS 38-431.03A1? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right. We are in executive session. See y'all later. Do I have a motion? to reconvene the business meeting? So moved. Second. Um, all righty. Would everybody please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? And we have our student leader, Colton Lewis from Desert Sun, who is going to be leading us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Item 2.3, roll call. Um, all members of the governing board are here with the exception of Mrs. Almer. Uh, all members of the cabinet are present. Item 2.4, formal adoption of, a, of the agenda. Do I have a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any modifications? Okay. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Okay. Item 2.5, President's Report. Well, um, I had the pleasure of attending the Catch Shadows football game, and I believe they were playing Notre Dame when the Cave Creek Choir sang the national anthem. They did a fabulous job, and kudos to the choir. Um, I also attended the uh, senior nights for the football team and volleyball team, and I'd like to say congratulations to all of our senior athletes. Um, it's exciting and emotional when you're a senior and it's your last game. And uh, Last week and this week, I attended the Veterans Day celebrations at Horseshoe Trails, Sonoran Trails, and Lone Mountain. And thank you to all of our military service people, active and retired, and our first responders. And today, I was at Desert Willow for the coffee with the superintendent. And that's what I've done. All right. Um, item 2.6, board comments. Go ahead. Uh, I was uh, privileged to attend the October Employee of the Month breakfast, which is uh, held every month at the Summit Diner. Uh, such a great group of uh, teachers and staff. It gives us a few uh, minutes to talk amongst, uh, meet everybody and talk amongst ourselves and from all the different campuses and departments. So that's always a great event. Uh, Halloween day, I was on Lone Mountains campus for the a very popular storybook parade, and uh, some of the costumes that the kids wore were fantastic. Um, last Thursday, November 9th, I was at Desert Sun Academy for their uh, flag raising ceremony and then what was their first Veterans Day concert. The uh, fourth and fifth grade classes sang three songs, and then the sixth grade classes also sang three songs. Very, very well done uh, to all, everybody there. And then Monday, yet was Lone Mountain Elementary's Veterans Day uh, event where they had students read uh, essays and poems they had written. Uh, they sang some songs, and then they had a slideshow with uh, all of the veterans that have uh, family connections to the students at Lone Mountain. Uh, very well done with that. Uh, then as a kind of a surprise at the end of that event, and I'm probably taking some Fire away from Mr. Dolezal, the uh, CCUEF just happened to be there and was able to award grants to 17 of the Lone Mountain teachers. So that was uh, a, a great uh, PS to the Veterans Day event, be able to do it in front of, uh, give those checks out to all the uh, award winners in front of all the students and staff. And then just one other quick thing. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it came in the mail. You're probably getting it, if not already. It's our annual tax credit drive. Uh, very easy to do. You're able by household to, to send a check into the district 
for uh, just about anything. Uh, there's a whole laundry list of items that you can help uh, support the district. Uh, and I encourage everybody to do this if they haven't already. Anybody else? Uh, sure, yes, I was able to um, attend Antigone, a beautiful play that the high school did. was very impressed with the lighting and set that a lot of the seniors, um, actually Taylor Wright, did herself. So that was just a very beautiful show, nice um, modern take on one of the oldest plays there is. Um, also went to the Joker's Improv last week, got to see a lot of Cactus Shadows students make the audience laugh. Um, kudos to the, our um, Falcons on the mountain bike team. Four of them t placed in the top ten in the state, so that was a great win for us there. And then also got to witness a few of the grant the district checks go out yesterday as well. Um, thank you to all the parents that support all of those fundraisers from Golf the District. We have Run the District coming up after the holiday break, and then the big Rock the District to kind of finish um, out the school year. But, uh, I mean, super awesome to have that money go straight back to our teachers and into the classroom for our kids. So that's it. Awesome. Well, I didn't have all that much, but I am looking forward to uh, attending the Employee of the Month breakfast tomorrow. Awesome. So I'll be there for that, and I always look forward to that. Very cool. Well, thank you. Um, item 2.7, superintendent's report. Madam President, members of the board, uh, as mentioned already, I did get to accompany CCUEF uh, yesterday while well, they awarded uh, 57 teachers almost $100,000 total in grants. Uh, so we really appreciate That's a record for both uh, receptions. Yeah. I'd like to congratulate Cactus Shadows art teacher, Dara Parsons, and the following students whose artwork will be displayed at the Tempe Fall Festival December 1st through 3rd. Ella Miller, 11th grade, Ellie Parker, 11th grade, Iana Moffat, 11th grade, Ava Guerreri, 12th grade, Josh Henry, 9th grade, and Aubrey Lefebvre, 9th grade. Uh, as mentioned by several of the board members, uh, the seven schools celebrated Veterans Day. I was able to attend several of those events, and it, some of them brought tears and goosebumps to you as, as you participated. Uh, principals, a special shout out, and thank you for, for what you did to appreciate uh, the veterans in our community. Last month, uh, Cactus Shadows alumnus, Lindsay Weaver-Wright, who played golf while at Cactus Shadows, ended her 23 LPGA season when she holed out for an eagle from the fairway on 18 in her home course in Texas. Congratulations to Lindsay, forever a falcon. I'd like to congratulate Cactus Shadows Vivace Choir, who earned the highest award given a superior rating in their last fall choir festival competition. Congratulations to Sonoran Trails Middle School 7th grade baseball. They won the championship at the end of October. Way to go, Stingers. Cactus Shadows Marching Band had a very successful performance at the Adoba Berry Goldwater Marching Band competition. They finished 5th place in the Division 4, and they won the Spree de Corps Award as well. Rock on, band. Uh, congratulations to our student athletes who signed their letters of commitment during the Cactus Shadows Signing Day Ceremony Wednesday, November 8th. Maxine Curtin for beach volleyball to Colorado Mesa University. Nicole Feistel, golf to Indiana State University. Riley Doherty, golf to Utah Tech. Kira Day, softball to Idaho State. Courtney Zane, softball to Culver, sorry, Culver Stockton College. Isabel Wernick, soccer to the Air Force Academy. Emily Brashear, soccer to Boise State. And Cameron Custer, basketball, Montana State University Billings. I'd also like to congratulate Michelle Fumagalli, who signed with the Auburn University Equestrian Team as a Rainer. Congratulations to those Falcons. Uh, as mentioned earlier this month, our Mountain Bike Club participated in the Mountain Bike High School State Championships. We had Mia Quensler placing ninth in JV girls, Keely Bush placing seventh in JV girls, Allison Reamer placed third in freshman girls, and Vincent Guagenti placed fourth in the JV boys. There's so much our great things our students do. The following students were selected as finalists for the AZ State One Act Festival for their recent production of Medea. The show was actually directed by Cactus Shadows alum Mackenzie Moeller, class of 2018. They traveled to Phoenix this past weekend to perform in the State One Act Festival. 
Taylor Wright, Brooke Benter, William Lim, Dylan Schmidt, Morgan Heinz, Jocelyn Beaver, Avery Ryberg, Lila Phipps, Ava Daly, Maura Scherf, and Layla Lamorse. The Lady Falcons golf team finished second this season as state runner-ups. They were ranked number two the entire season. Sophomore Charlene Lamb finished tied for fourth, shooting one under par. And senior Riley Doherty came in tied for 10th. Cactus Shadows girls swim and dive took seventh place in the state meet. Ayanna Moffitt was declared state champion by winning first place in diving with a total score of 520.45. Her score also set the new state record. Individually, Captain Tara Bird earned ninth place for the 100 freestyle. The boys took ninth place overall, and they earned a fourth place finish in the state for the 400 free relay. Since this is our November meeting, the seasons have changed, and the spirit of gratitude is in the air. I'd like to express my deepest appreciation and thanks as I sit here as the interim superintendent of our beloved school district. First, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to my five bosses, the CCUSD Governing Board, for their steadfast commitment to our students' success in and out of the classroom. Your support, guidance, willingness to work together and create norms and commitments have laid the foundation of collaboration, trust, and achievement for the district. To our district leadership team, thank you for joining me on this journey and allowing me the honor of leading such intelligent, compassionate, and passionate group of educational professionals who are willing to do whatever it takes to help our schools and departments reach their full potential. To our exceptional educators, I am in awe of your enthusiasm and commitment to nurturing the minds of our students. Your tireless efforts to create engaging and inclusive learning environments have not gone unnoticed. You inspire our students to reach for their potential, even when they do not know it or see it themselves. For that, we are eternally grateful. To our dedicated staff members, we are indebted to you for your unwavering support behind the scenes, from maintaining the school facilities, to transporting our students, to feeding our students, to ensuring the safety and well-being of our students, to running our offices. Your hard work and dedication are the backbone of our district's success. To our community partners, I am grateful you stand alongside us in support of our students. Your commitment to education and your generous contributions have enriched the educational experience of our students in countless ways. We look forward to continuing our strong collaboration for the betterment of our students. I would also like to express my gratitude to our parents and guardians for entrusting us with the education and growth of their most prized possessions, their children. Your partnership and collaboration are vital in creating a thriving educational community. And we are fortunate to have such engaged and supportive families. Lastly, but certainly not least, I want to thank our incredible students. Your enthusiasm, resilience, and eagerness are the driving force behind everything we do. Your accomplishments and achievements in and out of the classroom continue to inspire us, and we are immensely proud of each and every one of you. I encourage everyone to reflect on the collective impact we have made and will continue to make together on the lives of our students. Together, we endeavor to set our students upon a path of excellence, compassion, and lifelong learning in order for our students to achieve success when they leave Cactus Shadows in their employment in the workforce, their enlisting in the military, or their enrollment in post-secondary education. I am truly thankful to be on this journey with all of you. Finally, I would like to introduce the Desert Sun Academy Student Leader of the Month on the dais with me this evening, Colton Lewis. Hi, my name is Colton Lewis. I'm in sixth grade at Desert Sun Academy. I really enjoy math class and I've recently found interest in chess. I'm developing leadership skills from being in student council and playing as quarterback for my football team. At my school, Desert Sun Academy, they encourage you to succeed and provide advanced assignments for areas you excel in. We also have lots of clubs such as chess club, video club, and student council. In middle school, I am really looking forward to having new classes, and I'm also hoping, hoping to make some new friends and play football. Thank you. And that concludes my superintendent's report. Okay. Um, 
Item 3.1, call to the public. We have none. All right, well then we will just move along. Item 4.1, Carefree Cares Excellence Award, presented by Mr. Dolezal and Mayor John Crane and Vice Mayor Cheryl Croyer. Good evening, I'd like to have uh, the Mayor and Vice Mayor come on up. Madam President and board members, thank you very much for the invitation for Vice Mayor uh, Cheryl Croyer and I to, to come before you tonight and honor uh, an exceptional student from each school. And reading the testimonials from the, from the presidents, there's a few, or from the uh, principals, there's a few key words that come out time and time again. So it goes, uh, goes above and beyond, goes the extra mile, transformative force, selfless, passion, commitment, unwavering dedication. So when I think back on the teachers that had the most impact to me, these are the kind of words many, many years later that come to mind. And I am certain that these teachers will have students decades later who will think back on, on those, uh, they'll have students who think back on these teachers who think the same way. So it's really an honor to be here and thank you for all those, everything those teachers do. Thank you, Mayor Crane. Our first recipient from Black Mountain Elementary School, Amanda Barnes. Congratulations. And we're going to ask you to stand up on the dais right here behind us till, till everyone's here. Our next recipient from Horseshoe Trails Elementary School, Clint Floyd. Our next recipient from Sonoran Trails Middle School, Ricky Francis. Our next recipient from Desert Willow Elementary School, Olivia Hammerman. Our next recipient from Desert Sun Academy, Tina Hirsch. Our next recipient from Lone Mountain Elementary School and our Exceptional Student Services Elementary Coordinator, Carrie McCullough. And although our last recipient from Cactus Shadows High School is absent tonight, she sends her regards and she's actually at a conference uh, learning more about educating and, and teaching Spanish. So uh, the Cactus Shadows recipient is Jocelyn Rott. All right. And Mayor and Vice Mayor, if you want to step up next to the recipients, we'll get a picture. I think everyone's done taking pictures. So you guys, one more round of applause, please. Thank you. And Mayor and Vice Mary, I'd really like to thank you for your support and education. You were one, part of the people I mentioned in my thanks for supporting us. Okay. All right. All right. 
Item 4.2, our November Students of the Month. It is with immense pleasure and pride that we come together to celebrate the extraordinary accomplishments of some truly exceptional individuals, our Students of the Month. Each month, we are priv privileged to recognize students who exemplify the core values that define our district. Perseverance, leadership, compassion, and a relentless pursuit of excellence. Tonight, we are not just honoring academic achievement, but also the qualities that make our students well-rounded individuals and future leaders. The renowned American author and poet, Maya Angelou, who once said, success is liking yourself, liking what you do, and liking how you do it. This sentiment perfectly encapsulates the essence of the students we are celebrating tonight. They have not only achieved remarkable success, but have done so with a genuine passion and a commitment to their craft. Our students of the month have shown us what it means to inspire excellence in every, everything they undertake. They have gone beyond their comfort zones, challenged themselves, and consistently demonstrated a willingness to learn and grow. They serve as beacons of inspiration for their peers and a source of Im immense pride for their families, teachers, and the entire community. Each student being recognized tonight has a unique story of dedication, hard work, and determination. Whether it's in academics, arts, athletics, community service, or leadership, these students have set a standard of excellence that we all can aspire to. They remind us that greatness is not a distant dream, but a tangible reality that can be achieved through unwavering commitment and a passion for what we do. Okay, so we, the board, are going to be up here presenting to each student, and as we call your name, please come forward and shake our hands. Our first student is Peyton Miller from Black Mountain Elementary School. Congratulations. Congratulations. Our next student from Lone Mountain Elementary School is Avi Mather. Our next student is Micah Summer from Horseshoe Trails. Congratulations. Connor Stahl from Desert Sun Academy. Zeke Quintana from Desert Sun Academy. Congratulations. Abigail Camarada from Desert Willow Elementary School. Sophie Moore, Sonoran Trails Middle School. And from Cactus Shadows High School, Alexander York. Parents, I encourage you to come up and get pictures if you would like to do that. 
You ready, Julia? All right. Item 4.3, the finan financial update presented by Mrs. Rodriguez. Good evening, uh, Madam President, members of the board. Um, I want to share a little bit of information um, with you this evening. I, I cannot believe I have to follow that act, but um, <laughs> I um, just wanted to keep you updated, always keep you informed on not only the financial status of the district, but of the state as well, and some of the things that I think are important for you as a governing board to know, um, as well as share with our community. So one of the um, things that we watch closely are the state revenue projections. Um, we watch this because if there is a shortfall mm -hmm. in state revenues, K-12 education is a large part of the budget. Um, so oftentimes we are the ones who get hit with cuts when the um, expenditures exceed the revenues. That is the case this year. Um, you can see that there is um, a shortfall in revenue. Um, I shared with the governing board in their, um, their weekly governing board update the full report um, where some of these snippets were drawn from. So if you are inclined to know, all of that um, is included in the General Legislative Budget Committee reports. Um, that is the JLBC, um, where, we re where I got this data from. Unfortunately, um, they, there was some personal um, income tax cuts we all benefited from, but as a result, the, um, the revenue that was collected was a lot less than what they anticipated by doing that flat, flat tax rate. So here's what we see. Now you'll see up there the shortfall um, will be resolved and not carried to the following year. Um, how do you do that? You have to cut somewhere. So there are some one-time budgetary things that the legislature can look at. Um, there is still uh, some balance in the rainy day fund that could possibly um, help make up for this cash balance, but we're gonna watch this closely as we go into negotiating um, and bargaining with our teachers, with our staff, um, and projecting what our budget outlook will be for next year. One of the things that we've discussed in the board meeting, and I've had several of um, community members and board members ask is, so what does the, the ESA, which is empowerment scholarships, what do empowerment scholarships, um, how do they impact the funding for K-12 schools? Here is um, what we know. They assumed that it was going to be um, $625 million, 68,000 students. It is currently 70,000 and some change. I'm just, I just looked at the, um, their website because they keep that updated every day. Um, and the award is $40 million more than they projected. Now, we don't know how many of the students that are contributing to that 70,000 are students that left the K-12 public school system. Therefore, the money will then be decreased from K-12 schools. Or are these students that were already attending public or private schools, are these students that were already homeschooled, and now they're just getting paid for something that they've already done. So it really doesn't decrease the budget. Um, ADE estimates $77 million um, in surplus. I, based on the numbers that I'm seeing in our reports that are coming out of ADE, they are not including all of our students yet. Mm -hmm. So I think that those numbers, that number is really high. I think by the time February comes around, you're gonna see that a lot lower. So they, um, they will be publishing a report sometime in December to really identify where those students have come from. We'll be able to get that information as a district so that we can see how many of our community um, members and our families are using the empowerment scholarships. Unfortunately, it's not gonna tell me if they were students in this district last year. Um, we know a lot of our students in our district already attend private schools. So this just must be, uh, it may be just now they're taking advantage of getting public tax dollars to fund their private school 
education. Um, when I look at 70,000 students in the state, um, just to get my head around how many students that really is. So Mesa Unified School District is the largest school district in the state. They have 57,000 students. So the number of students that are now receiving these scholarships are larger than the largest school district in the state. One of the things that always concerns us as public school um, educators is that um, we are held accountable at some very high standards. And um, Dr. Jensen is going to share some really great news with you this evening about the standards that we set here in our district. But those 70,000 students that are on the empowerment scholarships, there is no accountability for how successful the public tax dollars are being at educating those students. That is concerning. Obviously, that is the parents' responsibility to make sure their students are receiving a high-quality education. Um, and uh, But as a, a taxpayer, I would also like to know that the tax dollars that we're investing um, are being invested wisely and used wisely to um, serve the purpose of educating the students of the state. One of the other areas that we um, watch closely, and you heard about this a couple of years ago, the aggregate expenditure limit. This is the limit of how much money we can invest in public education. Um, K-12 schools, charters are not included, privates are not included, but school districts are in this under this limit capacity. This year and last year, the legislature um, overrode that we could exceed the limits and it's interesting to me because they set the budget for the schools of how much we can spend per pupil they set the limit and then if this limit is exceeded they want to take that capacity away from us so it's kind of um, an interesting dynamic that we have going on here in Arizona um, if there is no override which we know we've, we've exceeded the limit this year, we've done the calculation, but there was an override in place, so we aren't at jeopardy of having a decrease in our budget capacity. But if there is no override next year, then our budget will be at risk next year again. So I just wanted to put those handful of things, um, kind of um, inform the board of some of the, the things that we are watching as an administration in preparing for next year's budget. One of the other things, now we didn't go out for an election this year, we didn't, um, we, but we closely watch, you know, how many of these override elections, bond elections pass, because that kind of gives us a temperature check of what is the, what is the, the sense of out there in the community. Um, we know that economy is an issue right now. Um, people um, are feeling inflation and so, but what we saw in the overall elections, number of m and overrides, 24 were on the ballot, 19 of them passed. So about an 80% pass rate, okay? That's what it was last year. Um, so it's kind of steadied off. You can kind of see the history of, of how that goes. Um, some people say even years, odd years, uh, and it's all over the place, even year, odd year. It, um, kind of stay steady um, depending on where things are politically and in the economy. One of the things that we looked at was multiple questions. And this is information that was provided by um, Randy Stein at um, CIFL, who um, they are the advisors that we use oftentimes for our tax rates and when we sell bonds. So they produced a, a multiple question activity. One of the things that is really surprising to me is Deer Valley, one of our adjacent districts, did not pass either one. And I've lived in Deer Valley for 20 years, and I have never seen this happen before. I don't know what's going on over there in that district, but this was really shocking to me. Fountain Hills, that didn't surprise me. We've seen Fountain Hills have challenges passing bonds and overrides similar to um, the demographics that we serve in this district. Um, but you can kind of go down the line and see the pass-fail rate. Now, when 
when I um, pulled this multiple questions, we do have Scottsdale and Paradise Valley that also had, um, Paradise Valley had a bond um, election and Scottsdale had an override. They both passed. One of the things that we watch as well as we compete with teachers from those districts, um, you know, so there may be some conversations we have with some Deer Valley teachers. I, um, I just know that that's really a scary place for them to be right now. I know some teachers in that district and, and I really feel bad um, that this didn't, this didn't pass. So then let's bring it home. Let's talk about where we are. Um, one of the things that we do every year is we submit a report to the Department of Ed's, a school by school expenditure report. And so I pulled some data to share with you out of that. The school by school shows how much we spent, which is in the blue, and how much revenue is generated by that school based on their enrollment. And it could be many factors if they have special needs students, that type of thing. So you can see where we have some schools that are pretty much breaking even with the revenue we bring in, and then there are other schools that spend more than they bring in. Um, so as we are going through preparation for next year, we always look at efficiencies in our schools and how do we restructure things. So these are some of the factors that kind of play into that. School per pupil, um, are there specialized programs on those campuses? So are there language programs? Are there special ed um, education programs? Are there um, different kinds of specials on those campuses? Also, um, what grades are served? So high school, you'll, you saw the high school numbers, they look like they're bringing in more money than what they're actually spending out per pupil, but that is because high school students are funded at a higher rate. They're weighted higher. Um, school size matters. So if you think about that, you have some fixed costs on campuses, right? You still have to pay for the lights, you still have to pay for the principal and the uh, administrative assistant in the front office and the registrar. Um, so some of those things are just fixed. So no, you have to spread that over lower amount of students in the school. That's gonna have an increase in the per pupil amount that we see. Staffing ratios also. So number of students per class. So we watch this very closely. Um, this is something we review that enrollment report in cabinet once a month and we look to make sure that class sizes are fair and equitable as much as possible. You know, um, and we've made a couple of staffing adjustments this year because we did have some classes that were really small and then in other schools maybe the class sizes were larger. So we've had to make some adjustments. We, um, try to minimize that because we know that's disruptive to the classroom, um, but we have to um, work within the amount of funds that we have available, so sometimes that's necessary. The other thing, because there was a couple of schools, I'm like, I don't, I'm trying to figure out why the class sizes aren't unreasonably, you know, small. Why do they have a higher amount um, per pupil than their revenue? And a lot of it has to do with experienced teachers. So if you've got a school that has some longevity in their staff and they're higher paid, which is great, right? Which is great for the kids um, to have the higher experienced teachers um, teaching them, you're gonna see that maybe their per pupil expenditures are a little bit higher. So those are just some of the factors, but as cabinet, we will be looking at that. I just wanted to present that to the board so that you um, kind of have a little bit of a sense of the um, methods and the, the, the analysis that we go through as a cabinet when uh, we probably be bringing some recommendations to you um, regarding next year's budget and the next few budget meeting or board meetings. So having said all of that, is, um, there's a, just a, a couple of upcoming things. Um, we're still working on the demographer. He had come out and spoke to you um, a few months ago. Um, he's working on that report. I am in touch with him on a bi-weekly basis. I'm, where are we at? Where are we at? Where are we at? What, do you, what can we do for you? Um, I know he's kind of waiting for that um, empowerment scholarship information to come out in December. So um, I'm thinking early spring is when we'll be bringing that to you. And then um, also budget revision will be coming. I just got notification um, from the Department of Education. We get, four, we get a, a, 
a budget letter saying you have to revise your budget in December. We received that today and I knew we would because we had um, budgeted for higher enrollment than what we actually are experiencing. So I'll, I'll be bringing that revision to you in December. So having said that, now do we have any questions? Ms. Rodriguez, does the state have a cap on that, uh, the empowerment scholarships, or is that still open-ended? There is no cap on the empowerment scholarships right now. Okay. And then on your slide with the uh, multiple question activity, you had the two of the larger districts in the county, Gilbert and uh, Mesa, also didn't pass their bond. Were you a bit surprised about that? Well, M Mesa is always very thin um, and their pass rates. So this is the second time he's got out for a bond. I, I personally know the CFO over there and I know how hard he works um, to do this. And I wasn't surprised. They, they have a, um, a community there that also is very um, strong in um, no more taxes. Um, and then they also have lots of large families there that the economy is, you know, really kind of taken um, a, a hit on people's perspective on I can't spend 10 more dollars on taxes. So not wasn't surprised. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? No, just thank you for the information. That was, it's always. Yeah. I, I appreciate the effort that you took to put that together. I just have one question. Do you know if the state has any, um, made any indication that they're going to address the empowerment scholarships at all and, and revamp it? No, I have no indication. As a matter of fact, I see more and more commercials on TV. Oh, wow. You know, encouraging that. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well. All right. Um, well, you get to pay, follow that. Item 4.4, school letter grade presentation presented by Dr. Jensen. Thank you, President Busby, members of the board. Uh, we get to bring you back up after Marcy brought you down. So um, <laughs> the uh, purpose of this presentation is to present school letter grade information and to inform the governing board and the public about continuous school improvement planning process in Cave Creek USD through our school goals. Um, as you know, um, we're constantly improving. We're in education, we like to learn, we always want to do something better. And so um, this is always kind of a fun presentation to give, to brag on the things we did well, and to um, show you very openly the areas that we need to improve. So um, the short answer, why does Arizona have an A through F system of letter grades? Um, it's, I think it's uh, to mostly to make it very transparent and easy for parents and the public to compare schools um, and to rate them somehow. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't add on to Marcy's um, dig at the private schools and that they do not have letter grades. They do not have any way of transparently showing the public what they are doing with um, now public funds and um, how they are performing. Uh, what do the letter grades mean? It, it is pretty self-explanatory. A is obviously the, the top, excellent. B is highly performing. C, performing. D, minimally performing. And F, failing. Um, obviously, based off of some of these grades, you can be placed in a need of an, uh, an area where you need to go through plans for improvement. Um, thankfully, we do not have that in Cave Creek right now. So with that, um, Mrs. Hill is going to share a bit about the models that we use. <laughs> Yay! All right, so um, I'm excited to get to present with you guys a little bit about the different models and how the state does calculate the letter grades. Um, K through eight has a different model than high school does. And then there's also the non-typical model for our online schools as well. So we're gonna kind of quickly go through that. The K-8 model um, focuses 30% on proficiency, 50% on growth, and 10% for our EL students, and then 10% for our acceleration and readiness, which include things 
Like, are our subgroups being addressed? Do we have EL growth? What, just how are we continuing to grow? So there's another 10% there. This is the basic overview. Again, it shows you that, especially in the K-8, the ones that we were focused on last year was the grade eight math and grade three ELA. That's making sure that our minimally proficient students in grade three are below the move on when reading cut score. And then grade eight math is, did we increase our highest proficiency? And then did we also lower our minimally proficient student? As well as one of the things we were targeting last year was chronic absenteeism, especially coming out of COVID. And then you can see our special ed and our subgroup improvement is in there as well. So good news, um, all of our elementary schools rated an A, and our middle school, which did an amazing job, um, is a B, but it is just two points away. They were so, so, so close um, to getting that A, and I know both myself and Ms. Madsen, we scoured over looking to see if there were any little points, um, and I know Mrs. Serena was looking for that as well because they are doing amazing things through their PLCs there and continuing to grow. Last time I was here, there was a question about a comparison to our nearby charter schools. Again, these are our public charter schools. We can't compare them to our private schools that are nearby. So Candeo, um, North Scottsdale, which is the one that's right over here off of Ashler Hills, they did have a letter B. I would like to point out, though, that uh, Sonoran Trails was a lot higher in their B. They were at 82 points as opposed to um, 78. 78. Very good. Thank you. I had it marked here. Uh, Great Hearts, Scottsdale Archway is an A as well, and Stepping Stones is a B. Another great thing to point out here is that with this charter school that is an A, we were also very steadily higher than them in points. So um, we're doing a great job in relationship to the nearby charters that are next to us. Our next slide looks at um, traditional hybrid K-12 schools where our students that are zoned for CCUSD have gone to open enroll um, and just how they've kind of done. So Scottsdale Prep, North Phoenix Prep, ASU Digital, which is with our AOE, and then American Virtual, which is Primavera. And again, you can see right there, we are doing as well, if not better than some of those. And we, we chose those ones because that's where we lose the majority of our students online. So it was based off of withdrawal data. All right, the next part, so that was the K-8 model, is grades 9 through 12 with Cactus Shadows. And the big thing to be aware of here is, and there's a difference in the slideshow, 21-22, the proficiency was worth 30% and the growth was worth 20%. This year, the growth score is calculated solely from the subgroup improvement. So we're really needing to target, and so if we go to the next slide, we can see that's the big change in the growth. And so that little highlighted area is the subgroup proficiency improvement, subgroup graduation rate. So are we targeting our neediest students and making sure that they're not only growing academically, they're graduating, and then are we addressing the dropout rate as well? This is the area um, that Cactus Shadows we need to put some focus on, and that's in one of our levels. We did lose some points, a, a good majority of points, about eight points within this area with the change to this model. We are still an A, but it's something we definitely want to be cognizant of as we go into next year um, because more weight will be put on these subgroups. Um, compared to our local public schools, again, we're doing a pretty good job. This was based on data not only um, for nearby schools, but as well as schools that our high schoolers have chosen to open enroll in as well. So that was the data, and then it's the now what. Um, so we call these our high leverage areas, places where we can get more points and where we get the most bang for our buck um, by investing in these areas. So our top one, uh, Ms. Hill alluded to it a bit with, uh, we need to focus on our subgroups. And so we're creating, and by subgroups we mean, um, I mean, white is also a subgroup so it's not just minorities or anything of that sort but basically smaller pockets that um, the educational system has created to ensure that all students are making progress not just the majority of students so it it um, makes it looks very closely at each group of students um, so we're making sure that we have guaranteed systems of support for those students specifically our english learners um, I'm saying specifically at the secondary levels, but 
um, Mrs. Madsen and Mrs. Hill went around to every elementary school and the middle and the high school to make sure that our programs that we're using for our English learners are being implemented with integrity and that nobody is slipping through the cracks, so to speak. And so we've actually um, massively increased the amount that we're spending in some of our grant dollars, um, our federal grant dollars towards some of our English learners just this year. Um, second was, and I'm going to go ahead and preface this with number or, or all of the rest of the bullets I had up last year as well, because um, if you just play the math game, that's how we get the most points in this formula. And I'm proud to say that in every single one of those areas, we met that goal and we're resetting it for this next year. So we want to continue to decrease the number of third grade students that are in the lowest performance um, category. And last year, four of our five schools did. The one that did not, there's some odd exceptions that we won't get into. Um, but we're watching that very carefully. Um, third, we want to decrease the number of eighth grade students in the lowest performance category of minimally proficient for the math test. Same thing. We met that goal, um, decreasing from 35% to 29%. So about 6%, which is a very big um, movement. Um, the next one is increase the number of eighth grade students in the highest performing cat performance category of highly proficient for the math test. And again, we did decrease or increase that from 20% to 24%. So um, that was something to celebrate as well. Um, and then we have increased the rigor of questioning in, in class to align with the AASA, the ACT, Aspire and the ACT and Mrs. Hill has been hard at work since she jumped over to this other position um, making sure that our teachers have uh, benchmark tests that are aligned to the ASA um, and so that they're seeing those questions off often to make sure that all freshmen have had a chance to see the ACT Aspire before they get th or, uh, the practice tests before they get dumped right into the real thing. And then um, lastly, decrease the percentage of chronically absent students through attendance campaigns. Uh, we did that at all of our schools. We may have done it a little too well, um, so we're gonna really need to push hard this year because we need to continue to decrease in order to capture those points again. Click, sorry. Um, so overall, we are graded as an A, as a district, so you guys can all go out into the community and brag on CCUSD being an A-rated district. Uh, which is a big deal. With that, are there any questions? I have one question in regards to the EL learners. Um, I would, get, I mean, I think there's a lot of law around that, what you would think support could come, but you're very limited to. Can, um, um, as far as what, um, say like a sophomore at the high school has to be taught at a so sophomore level, I believe, versus even if they don't speak the language, they're still taking sophomore English, correct? Mm -hmm. Like as far as what their schedule is like? They, they still need an English class. Oh, yeah. Um, yes. And we do need them to be grade level standards, but the language can be scaffolded all the way up. And so the, the key okay. is, is to find non-linguistic representations in order to help them understand um, what's going on. Um, right now it is a little touchy in terms of can you use their native language to support or not? Mm -hmm. You can, um, but yes, they do need to be, the, the laws are mostly the amount of English they need to be exposed to each day, which is a lot. Um, and then we do want to keep them on track for graduation. Um, do you want to add on that? Sure. And absolutely, I know the sophomore you're talking about. Um, so the, the one thing that we're really working hard with our EL students is they're in um, their regular English class and then they also are in a pullout or a reading lab. That reading lab is really where they're going to be getting, so it's an hour a day. All of our EL students are in the pullout model, so an hour out of the classroom with a reading specialist or someone who's been trained in hopefully getting those EL strategies up, exposure to the language, practicing communication skills, practicing basic reading skills that are harder to do in the sophomore level classes and then the other hour they are in with their general education peers. The challenge that we're seeing uh, specifically in the secondary which is why um, we are putting a lot of focus there that we have not put before is helping our teachers scaffold the learning. 
because a lot of them are just quite frankly, I don't know what to do with this kiddo who doesn't speak English in front of me. How are they going to read Frankenstein? They're not going to read Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. You're going to have to scaffold it back and find something at their Lexile level. So that's where Ms. Madsen and I have kind of come in and tried to support them. It's definitely a slow roll um, as we get to meet with the high school teachers and the middle school teachers um, and just making sure that they have access to books in their library that are on text that look like a seventh, eighth grade, ninth grade book but are easily to be, um, can be easily decoded, read, comprehension. And so a lot of that work is coming as well during the PLCs, meeting with those specific teachers, the language lab teachers or reading lab teachers, and talking with them about what are the projects going on, and I'll speak specifically for the middle school because I was over there yesterday, um, meeting with the seventh and eighth grade teachers and saying, okay, they're gonna have a book report on character development. We need to find a text that's on level readable so the child's making meaning of what they're reading not just word calling and then they're able to participate at their level but there is as dr jensen said there's a lot of scaffolding that needs to be done at the secondary level um, and emily's opinion we're going to continue to keep getting more and more el students especially as they build um, those factories out on the 303 i know deer valley saw a huge infusion of their el population not only spanish speaking so we're going to need to make sure that we shore up those practices. Thank you. And I think more of my question was, as an educator, are there things that you feel like you're hindranced by law um, as far as supporting them as things have kind of changed? So by law, you can't have things in their classroom that are like labeled. So I can't have like table mesa. Right. I can't, I can't have things that are bilingual. So yeah. a lot of it is through um, TPR, total physical response and it's requiring our teachers at the secondary level who may not have had as much experience or exposure in doing that, yeah. as well as at elementary, a lot of it is animated and right. pantomiming and moving around, trying to keep five-year-olds under control. It's a little bit more difficult at the high school. Yeah, okay, thank you. You know what the percentage of ELL students is right now? Uh, we have 87 EL students in our school district right now. And they all speak Spanish except for one who speaks Farsi. <laughs> um, one question. Mm -hmm. When they're, you're tracking growth from one year to the next, mm -hmm. is it a cohort of students or is it just this whole group of third graders did this and now we have new third graders? So in terms of how the state tracks it, they have this really funny voodoo math, I call it. Um, but it is, they compare th third grade to third grade. So it's not a cohort, which makes it hard because it's not apples to apples. So if, if Bobby's in third grade this year, it's a new Joey who's going to be representing their scores next year. Bobby's up to fourth grade now. Which is why it, at one of our schools, like I said, I didn't want to get too far into it, but at one of our schools, that's why that cohort didn't, um, they didn't decrease in their minimally proficient for English, um, for English in third grade. And that was because the next cohort of students had uh, probably 10 to 12 students who have been behind since kindergarten and we've been doing everything we can. They've got every intervention that we can give them, but uh, you know, and they're making growth, but they didn't make enough growth to be out of the minimally proficient range. And so we were comparing perhaps a stronger group the year before to this lower group, I'll call them, this year. Okay. So, and so that you. one figures into the proficiency, but then the growth, when you look, it's again, another voodoo. I have a whole slideshow if you want to see it. Um, <laughs> and Bill has it too, or Mr. Dole is all. But um, then they look at the partially proficient. So if you scored partially proficient in third grade, that part goes into the growth. Then you're compared against the other students who scored partially proficient. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get the growth on one side and then the proficiency on the other that factor in. Well, thank you for that. One other question. In middle school, there are groups of kids who are in advanced math, so mm -hmm. they get to go to Cactus Shadows for their math. 
right? Not anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. Well, they. Uh, um, well, I believe there's. Ms. Sereno, how many? One student. Oh, well, then, <laughs> then my goes question to school. is pretty much moved. So if there's only one, so yes, uh, they are. I will still say that there are eighth graders who are in a more like there's different levels of math in eighth grade, but in terms of being bussed over to the high school, we have enough at the middle school that they're taking algebra at the middle school. Okay, so those kids that are taking algebra when they're tested in algebra is not eighth grade math. So do those kids negatively impact? the score because I know in years past it was like well you know they learned it and they've moved on now you're asking them to come back to you that's know that's a really good question so what we've done is through the benchmarks they do still have to take the eighth grade benchmarks so that they're making sure that they're making progress and they're not forgetting those skills because they are gonna to have to take the eighth grade ASA test at the end of the year. So when I was able to go over and meet with the Sonoran Trails teachers, we looked specifically at one of the ninth grade, the teacher who was teaching an algebra class, and she said, okay, these are what the eighth grade skills I need to go back and really refocus on during intervention so that that doesn't happen. So we're hopefully trying to catch that. Yeah, awesome. And along those lines, one of the things we did uncover this year is, maybe it's not this year, but we really noticed it this year is that we do have some students at the high school who are not taking uh, a science class that's aligned to the ACT. They're choosing other routes to get their sciences that perhaps might be, they think, are easier. And they're not aligned to the ACT. And so that's an issue we're addressing through our course catalog and through course planning with the counselors um, because it's not right to put them in an ACT test uh, or, I'm sorry, AZ Sci, um, where they have not seen that their junior year. Awesome. Zoology is not on the AC side. Just kidding. So it's not. Okay. Just Biology, kidding. physics, and chemistry are. <laughs> Any other questions? Just a, a couple. Uh, Dr. Jensen, on the two areas that you focused on this year from last year uh, results, your grade 8 math and your grade 3 ELA, were your results this year what you expected, better or a little below? Grade eight and grade three? Yeah. They you were said. what we, ex I mean, I would say they were what we expected. So we, we set it at decreased for the number of students who were in the lowest, and we decreased. We did not tie ourselves into a percentage. Um, but in, and in all honesty, I guess you could even say dropping from 35% to 29%, that, I, that's pretty significant. And I would say that's actually probably better than we had maybe even expected just in my head, I had never stated it out anywhere. <laughs> right. And then on the slide that you had uh, Cactus Shadows compared to our other uh, nearby public high schools, since you knew uh, the one middle school, how they scored, do you, uh, and if you don't want to say numbers, uh, were we middle of the pack, above or below our neighbors? Um, in, in terms of the public high schools, because of the subgroup, we were not higher than our neighbors, is, I, I will say it that way. Um, it is all public, so it's out there, and, and anybody can search it um, on ADE's website. But because of that subgroup, some of our neighbors have dealt with subgroups a lot longer than we have, and so they have more systems in place. We have 80, what did you say, 87, 87. Um, ELs district-wide. Um, many of them have 87 in one grade, um, yeah. you know, in ninth grade. And so they have a full schedule. Those students would, would probably often have a completely different schedule, whereas ours, we're, re we're requiring teachers to adjust individually in a classroom. And system-wide, that's a lot harder, actually, than mm -hmm. having, having it as part of your system. And then just refresh my memory, this year when we test in April, this will be the third year with the AASA? Yes, it will be the okay. third yes. year. All right. Yes, Thank you. Yes, that's correct. For, I have one more question. For the eighth grade math, since they offered the honors, are there a lot more kids in that than there were that used to be bust? Because if they're teaching both, actually, that should help the scores, right? If they're scoring much higher, if they're getting their proficiency at least in what's there, plus they're technically a grade level above. Do we know any of that? I guess you'd only have one year of data so far. Yeah, Member Walker, that's a good question. I don't know. I'd have to look up to see how many students were bust. Did we bust them for algebra or we, did we only bust them for geometry? 
So uh, we're still only busing okay. the one for geometry. Okay. Um, and then algebra, it's just that we're offering it in eighth grade, which okay. I think we have been for a long time. Right? Correct. Member Walker, yes, we've been offering algebra at Sonoran Trails for 20 some years. Okay. Okay. Mute point then. There you go. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you both for the presentation and the great news. Our pleasure. Awesome. Okay. Item five, action consent. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Action consent passes. Item six, old business, we have none. Item seven, new business. 7.1, first reading of policy BCB. Board member conflict of interest, presented by Mr. Dolezal. President Busby, members of the board, the administration would recommend that the governing board take the following action. This item will be brought back for a final reading, in which case there is no action required, or move that the governing board approve the revisions to policy BCB, board member conflict of interest, as a first and final. Okay. Is there a motion? So moved. A second. So moved. Any discussion? Let's. What are we going to do with this one? It seems pretty reasonable to me. It covers all the areas of conflict, and so I, I don't see why we need to read this one again. Okay. I don't, I don't see any changes that we need to make. Okay. Well, I would like to amend the motion, unless there's other commentary, that this be a first and final reading of policy BCB. Is there a motion for the amendment? So moved. Second. Second. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Item 7.2, first reading of policy BE school board meetings. Madam President, the you made a motion to amend, yeah, and we which is what you had to vote for the first time, so then you need to do a vote on the new motion. We did. We did. We yep. did. Okay. And then we did another motion for the amendment, and we voted on the amended motion. Okay. Okay. All right. 7.2, first reading of policy BE school board meetings presented by Mr. Dolezal. Madam President, member of the board, the administration would recommend the governing board take the following action. This item will be brought back for a final reading, in which case there is no action required, or move that the governing board approve the revision to policy BE school board meetings as a first and final. Is there a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Okay. What would we like to do on this one? Any comments? There, there weren't that many changes to this one, were there? No. I, I had it printed out, but I couldn't find it. I think it's fine the way it was. So leave it as is? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So what was in the board packet was an amended agenda or an amended policy. So I would like to amend the motion so that there are no changes to policy BE. Is there a motion? We leave it as is. So moved. Second? Second. All right. You're leaving the current BE policy as BE. is. As so is. we're not voting to, to change. Um, we're not changing it. Okay. Okay. Leave it as is. Okay. As a first yeah. yeah. As a first and final. Yeah. Is uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Item 7.3, first reading of policy BEDA, notification of board meetings. Mr. Dolezal. Madam President, Governing Board, the administration would recommend the Governing Board take the following action. This item will be brought back for a final reading, in which case there is no action required, or move that the Governing Board approve the revisions to policy BEDA, notification of board meetings, as a first and final. So moved. Second. 
discussion? I think the additions about the executive session and the exceptions for uh, when there's issues like that the, for addressing the meeting are sufficient, I, I think we can accept this. Anybody else? Okay. Scott, do you have any comments? Okay, then I will amend the motion that this be a first and final reading of policy BEDA. I need a motion. Uh, so moved. Second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Item 7.4, reading of policy CBI, evaluation of superintendent. Mr. Dolezal. Madam President, members of the board, the administration would recommend that the governing board take the following action. This item will be brought back for a final reading, in which case there is no action required, or move that the governing board approve the revisions to policy CBI, evaluation of the superintendent, as a first and final. So moved. Second. Okay. Um, this policy is kind of is counter to what we have in our existing, and it kind of goofs up our timeline. So I would, uh, my recommendation is that we just table this and do nothing. So do I need to amend this motion? Well, and, and Madam President, if you want to table it, you can table it or... <laughs> You can just vote. you can vote you can vote it down. I mean that's another option as well. Um, please remember that all of these seven point one to seven point nine these are these are recommendations by ASBA. It is not there's nothing statutorily that requires you to assume or to take these on. So these are totally optional in what you want to do. Um, knowing that we're in process of switching to the trust pol model pro policy program. Um, you know, I just put that in, in the back of your head as a thought in terms of whether or not we truly, whether or not you truly want to go ahead and modify policy for the next seven months as we work on that. Um, so again, these 7.1 through 7.9 are options given by ASBA um, and they are totally optional. So ultimately it would be your call if you wanted to table it or if you just wanted to leave the existing policy alone as you did uh, on 7.2. Okay, I will amend the motion so that we will uh, leave CBI as is currently and we make no revisions. Is there a second? Second. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? All right, 7.5, first reading of policy EBC emergencies presented by Dr. Jensen. The administration would recommend that the governing board take the following action. This item will be brought back for final reading, in which case there is no action required, or move that the governing board approve the revisions to policy EBC emergencies as a first and final. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, any thoughts on this one? Do we want to leave it as is and... I think just so. leave it as that. Dr. Jensen, do we have we have some kind of policy already in place to how we communicate with our students with disabilities, correct? Whether it's notifying caregivers or we, we definitely make sure that and I think this is for within the school day. Um, if there's a student with a disability, how do we make sure that they are aware? So yes, it's definitely a practice we have. Um, I, this would just require that we document that in our emergency operation plans and vice president brown having done safety for the last two years we already do this we already have in all of our emergency response plans any medically fragile or any any students that might need assistance we already specifically outline and, and have a plan for that so that we're covered here we've been doing this already so then we should keep this policy e b c as is Okay, not, I will amend the motion that motion. we uh, keep policy EBC as is and no changes be made to the policy. Second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. 
uh, 7.6, first reading of policy JFABDA, admission of students in foster care, presented by Dr. Jensen. The administration would recommend that the governing board take, no, or take the following action. This item will be brought back for final reading, in which case there is no action required, or move that the governing board approve the revisions to policy JFABDA, admission of students in foster care, as a first and final. So moved. Second. Uh, thoughts on this policy? Well, I'm going to ask Dr. Jensen the same question. Where, where we are at currently with this same policy, do we need to make this change? I, I think, um, Vice President Brown, that's a good question. And I'm going to echo what Mr. Dolezal said earlier, that um, we're, we're mostly already doing these things. Um, these are not due to to legal reasons. That's why they weren't put into action consent. Um, so it's simply if we want our policy to mimic the ASBA recommended policy for the next six, seven months, or if we're okay just saying that's going to be caught up in the, in the revision. So it's, yes, our practices are already in line with this. Well, especially for this one, because our current policy has an R, a regulation page and actually and then has two different exhibits which obviously asba didn't cross check those three documents to make sure now there isn't any conflicting uh issues from what they're recommending to change this so without us digging into those three uh, the regulation in the two exhibit forms you know if we're if we're already doing this then i see no need to 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 make this change Okay, I will amend the motion so that policy JFABDA stays as is and we make no amendments to the policy. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. 7.7, .7, first reading of policy JKE, expulsion of students. Dr. Jetson. Thank you. The administration would recommend that the governing board take the following action. This item will be brought back for a brought back for a final reading, in which case there is no action required or move that the governing board approve the revisions to policy JKE, expulsion of students as a first and final. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, any comments on this one? Go ahead. Almost. <laughs> Go ahead. The broken record here is going to ask Dr. Jensen once again. Obviously, 7.8, 7, 7 7.9 are all kind of lumped together. They're all kind of the same, in the same genre. And again, 7.7, uh, 7, there's the policies JK, JKD, which isn't really addressed. And 7.9, you've got, a, again, a regulation and two more exhibit forms that they, you know, that would need to be reviewed to make sure we're okay. Uh, it seemed like it was the same item added to all three of these policies with the expulsion of a younger student for reason. Mm -hmm. I would think, again, our practices would, would cover us here in the next six, seven months as we're working on our policies. That is correct, Vice President Brown. And and what I believe this has to do with is the, um, there was a recent revision in the legislation because if you remember, we were not able to suspend young children as in kinder, I think under 10 um, before at all. Um, and then there were some conditions that we had to meet if we were going to suspend a, a younger child. And then now it's been really revised even more and um, I think it's just kinder and first this, at this point in time. So this is, I think, to make, to, to bring that back in alignment with this expulsion, which, knock on wood, I would hope does not happen in the next six months, um, or if it has ever, in a, for a young child. And Vice President Bound, it also has to do with that suspension not exceeding two days um, for a suspension, because again, as Dr. Jensen mentioned before, it was you had to you had to meet seven distinct criteria in order to be eligible to suspend a student that was that age. Um, and now there's been some some legislation and, and 
return of freedom in terms of what is best for that child and that individual circumstances that our elementary principals work through. And they can now, without meeting that threshold of those seven requirements, suspend for up to two days. We do not require that to be in policy in order to do that. That's just clarifying it in this regard. I thought it was odd that this was also a policy that they didn't have their copyright st uh, tag on. So now, I, you know, this is just their recommendation. This is their so. recommendation. Correct. So we, we would be absolutely fine remaining with the one that we currently have. Okay. I will amend the motion that we um, keep policy JKE as it currently exists in our policy book and have no revisions. Can we do that for these next three since can they're pretty much them, the same? Can we love or do we have to go through each one? Uh, I have, have to go to through each one, one since okay. they're yeah. listed. So there was it's a, the same it's a, discussion yeah. for the next two, for sure. Okay. When they do Madam that, President, we can we can expedite the conversation if you mm -hmm. would like to do that on each one, though. Okay. And when we go through this transition, will this kind of redundancy be addressed in the in the new versions of the the policies? Great question, Member Fortney. Um, I'm excited by having looked and started digging into these, um, how much, you know, something that was in four policies in here is limited and it's in one policy um, with the trust. So it is streamlining and kind of putting things that make sense to go together, together in a more organized fashion. So I think we'll see some of that uh, moving forward. Yeah. Um, there was a second on this. So all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. 7.8, first reading of policy JK student discipline. Did you do The administration. Right? <laughs> what? I'm sorry, pardon me, Dr. Jensen. Did you did the amended motion? Did you get a second? Oh, yeah. sorry, I missed yeah, yeah. the second. My bad. Right. Sorry. Dr. Jensen, I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I'm gonna take this one for you. Uh, Madam President, Governing Board, the administration, would recommend <laughs> that you maintain the current policy JK as written. So moved. Second. Any discussion? No. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Item 7.9, first reading of policy JKD, student suspe suspensions. President Busby, members of the board, the administration would move that you keep the currently pol current policy JKD as written. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. All right. Item 8.1, upcoming calendar events. Mr. Dolezal. Uh, well, as you heard in my reports, uh, Thanksgiving is upon us. Uh, so Thanksgiving break, schools are closed uh, next Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, then November 22nd through the 24th. Uh, district office is closed the 22nd through the 24th as well. And just FYI, so you hear it from me now, there will be no weekly update next week. You'll get one this week, but during the Thanksgiving holiday, we will not be sending a weekly update to you all. Okay. Um, item nine, adjournment. Do we have a motion? So moved. A second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. 